Well, good evening. Good to see you all tonight. We'll get started here. Hopefully when you came in, I noticed we were out of outlines in the foyer, but there are some here on the front pew if you didn't get an outline for the message tonight or a prayer sheet for tonight. But before we get to praying for specific needs, does anybody have anything to offer praise to the Lord about tonight? Sunshine. Sunshine. It's a sunshine day. Well, Boots has a big place. Yeah. Some movement. Some movement. And Hallelujah. So thank God for that, and he's wanting to come home and meet you when he gets here. Okay. So he brought all the wood, but that was a very big home. Good deal. And Debbie's feeling so tired there. Her husband needs some rest. Okay. Rest. Okay. Well, we praise the Lord for that. Anybody else have anything to praise the Lord about tonight? Anything to just say? Thank you, Jesus. Yes, we do. You see there's one missing there. That's right. Grace and Alec LaFew this morning, about 2 a.m., so uh, they had their child, so praise the Lord for that. Yes, Linda? Hallelujah. We praise the Lord for that, for Linda's brother. Good. Anybody else have anything to praise the Lord about? I got a call from the assistant principal at the elementary school about 1.30 this afternoon and said, hey, we have a lot of sickness on the campus with teachers and students and issues. Could you just come and pray over our school? Which is a praise the Lord <laughs> administrator would do that. So about the half a dozen of us got together and went over there when school was out at 3.30 and walked the halls and I was able to pray with several of the teachers individually and, and uh, ask them what some things they have. And so we praise the Lord for just the open door that we have because of our administrators there primarily. So we're thankful for that. Anybody else have anything to praise the Lord about? Yes, Chris? Okay. Yeah. I've, I've seen some things about that. So there's been some passing out spells and that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, okay, we certainly will. That's Clift, is that right? Clift family. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Clift. Um, you see our prayer needs there. Joe Graham, uh, he had a mild stroke on Saturday. And uh, um, somebody reached out to me and asked me if I knew anything, knew what was wrong with Joe, and I called him and... Uh, I texted him, actually, and he was in the ER when I texted him on Saturday, and then I had communication with Letitia yesterday and today. He was in ICU for several days. He's just been transferred to Siskin, and uh, he's expected to make a full recovery. So we can praise the Lord for that, but he'll be in Siskin for a little while uh, receiving therapy to get back on his feet. So we can pray for Joe Graham. Um, he's our county commissioner from this district. Jim Alsobrook, which is uh, Boots' husband, uh, is in the hospital, and we want to pray for him. Um, we, Jennifer already mentioned Ed and Debbie are improving, and so we praise the Lord for that. Claudette Andrews, she had COVID, I know, but I think she's on the mend. I actually saw her today. She came by the office, so I think she's doing better. Alan is still on here. I forgot to tell Nona we can remove Alan from the prayer sheet, but uh, we'll... <laughs> right. I, I forgot. Um... Uh, so we'll we'll pray for Alan too. Um, also, Sam Woolwine is in the hospital and he's having surgery tomorrow, and so we're actually going to go pray over him tonight when we're done here. And then many of you will remember Travis Reimer. Travis was my intern in student ministry twenty five years ago, and. Um, and then the Lord called him to Providence, Rhode Island. That's how we got connected in Rhode Island was through Travis. And he's now a full-time pastor in the church that's been planted there. Um, he let me know Friday that he's been diagnosed with rectal cancer. And um, he's probably 45 years old. Um, found out today that it is stage three. And um, so they're very concerned young pastor with three children 
so we need to pray for Travis. Um, it's Travis Reimer. Yeah, I'll do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Burned, B-E-R-N-D. Yep. Right. Yeah, she she texted me from Jamaica, um, and so to pray for burned, and she didn't find out till she got home. She told me today he had two heart attacks, and he didn't go in with the first one. Decided the second one. Well, I better go get something checked out. <laughs> so she was a little upset about that, but yeah, the there was no, there were no blockages, but he just has uh, small arteries feeding his heart. And so he's been on nitro and other medications to try to increase blood flow, but sometimes those medications enlarge other veins and capillaries and things, and so he's been having severe headaches over the last week. Uh, but he did go to work today for the first time, even though he's had headaches. So um, we certainly can pray for burned. That's uh, Nikki Bailey, who's the principal at the elementary school. That's her husband, um, burned. Yeah, any other prayer needs that you're aware of? Yeah, there is no update, unfortunately. Uh, nothing new that's positive. So they went to spend the weekend with Travis, excuse me, with Tracy and Ashley Trivet, and were supposed to share at their church Sunday, but on Sunday morning they were in such, she was in such pain, they left at like 5.30 in the morning to come back home. Such pain, they stopped in Augusta and with the Piedmont, ER. Um, she is some better. She's received some antibiotics, but um, still cannot diagnose. I mean, she was distended and in deep pain, and so um, I'm not a doctor, but I would say just take the gallbladder if that's it, you know, but um, anyway, she still has a gallbladder. She has had kidney cancer, but that is not the issue, so uh, we're thankful for that. It's not kidney cancer. Um, so that's kind of the update there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, they have provisional health insurance. So, yeah. But there may be some financial cost in, in involved here that we might want to help out with for sure. Any other prayer needs? Well, you see our missionary partners were highlighting this week. Patrick and the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home. Um, I just heard today that there is a, a zoning um, hearing for a new food city that is partially going to be from property of the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home that they're buying it. So apparently food city is buying some of the children's home because they got a massive campus. They're going to replace the food city that's on the corner of Shallowford and Lee Highway with a brand new one close to right next to the children's home. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't have to mow under those anymore. I ruined a mower under those pine trees. <laughs> I'm telling you, I ruined it. I ruined it. Um, yeah. And then. Uh, what? There you go. Yeah. It was kind of a good thing, maybe. Um, also, Sarah and Casper. We praise the Lord for their work in Zimbabwe. And then you see we only have two expectant parent couples left. Woohoo! <laughs> so, I'm telling you, I got to start uh, ringing that bell. Hey, come on now. We don't want to have the empty box there on expectant parents. So, let's spend a few minutes praising the Lord in prayer through some of the things that we've mentioned uh, this evening and then lift up these needs uh, to the Lord as he brings them to your mind, and then I'll close us in just a few minutes, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Lord, great is your name and greatly to be praised. There are so many things that we regularly walk in that are just part of your common grace that you've given us in this life, in this world. And so, Lord, help us to be mindful of those things that we take for granted, but yet are gifts from your hand. Lord, we thank you for the sunshine today and how it just warmed our skin as we walked outside and we can see clear skies and just what a gift that was from you during the day today. Lord, we thank you for your healing in the lives of some of these that we've mentioned and how they're feeling better and on the mend. Lord, I thank you that Linda's brother's uh, reception of this pacemaker has been success, successful and effective. Lord, I pray that you'd give him full strength and health as soon as possible. Lord, we do pray for Joe Graham as he's in Siskin. I pray that he can recover as soon as he can as possible and and follow the treatments that he's there lord the same for jim that uh, you would bring healing to his life and and just help boots to have rest um during this season lord thank you that ed and debbie are better and so is claudette and alan as well um lord we pray for um, the clift family as they are um, just experiencing different medical issues and health issues we pray for your sustaining power upon them God, for, for Sam, as he's going to be having surgery tomorrow, I pray that uh, even the preparation that he's been going through today would be effective and not too discomforting. Lord, we pray that um, as they perform that surgery in the morning that it is um, effective at, at providing healing. But Lord, we ultimately trust him to you and ask that you would bring healing to his body. Lord, for Burns Bailey, uh, thank you that they did... Uh, identify and diagnose the heart issue that is genetic um, that he has. I pray that the medication would regulate in his body and that he would not have any long-term side effects from that or that he can be at full health as soon as possible. Lord, I pray for Travis uh, this evening. Um, he is a good friend and my heart is, is broken over this diagnosis that he's received. God, he is also a choice servant of yours pastoring that church in Providence with uh, great passion and effectiveness and uh, just a heart for the word and for the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would be with uh, Rebecca and his three children as they navigate this with him and help them to be strong, to hope in you, Lord, that you can be glorified even through this cancer diagnosis. Thank you for the children's home and the great work they're doing uh, here in this part of the state, and how we have an opportunity, uh, ongoing partnership with them for ministry and care for those who are um, in hurtful situations. Lord, for Sarah and Casper and their sacrifice to be uh, in Zimbabwe to, to meet those that are less fortunate with care, with provision, but ultimately with the good news of Jesus. God, we do pray for Amy Cope and ask that you would bring healing to her body, give wisdom to them physicians that are caring for her and that are seeking to diagnose the the source of this discomfort that she's having god we thank you for the delivery of alec and grace's little baby we thank you that grace is doing well we pray that you would continue to bring healing to her body and recovery from the delivery as soon as possible and lord what an honor and gift it is to have a family of faith where new babies are coming into our our family regularly now, God, I do pray as we look at your word tonight that you would help us to know the truth about eternity and about the reach of your redemption. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, hopefully you got an outline. There's still a handful on the front pew. If you did not, we're in week number three of this semester's study that I'm leading called Finally Home, which is a look at heaven, where we will spend eternity. And so we've considered a few things about this already. Last week, we looked at what I refer to as temporary heaven. Temporary heaven. And most of what we think about when we think about heaven, a lot of times our thoughts and our ideas really kind of land on that intermediate state, that intermediate period between death and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, I told you in week one of this study that we were going to spend the bulk of our time not on intermediate heaven, not on temporary heaven, where we just kind of are passing through, but we're going to spend the bulk of our time on eternity, where we will live forever and ever and ever. 
And so I want us to think about, as we begin considering that, uh, how far does Christ's redemption reach? What was accomplished through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? Is Christ's redemption only applicable to believers? Are only Christians those who are redeemed? Or are there there other far-reaching implications about his redemption and i think what we'll discover is yes there are much further reaching implications about christ's redemption and probably things that we don't really think about that often again last week we considered uh temporary heaven that intermediate period um but that season of time of chronology is infinitesimally small compared to how long we will be in our final home our final existence. Um, You know, many religions, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, they picture the afterlife in very vague terms and really kind of this intangible existence. And sometimes we can think that way too, that it's just kind of a floating around, this ethereal um, existence. But that is not at all the picture that the Bible paints about heaven. In fact, God has implanted in our hearts a place and the place is called eden eden god created adam and eve and placed them in the garden of eden he created them in innocence and they were there with responsibilities genesis 3:15 the lord god took the man excuse me 2:15 the lord god took the man and put him in the garden place of domestic responsibility and he gave him two tasks work it keep it he wasn't just there to you know hang out he had a job to do he had responsibilities and that work that responsibility brought fulfillment Um, and so heaven is not just sitting around doing nothing there is going to be in our hearts we have this longing for something that's satisfying to us something that is fulfilling and even something that is physical physical Um, we long for what the first man and the woman enjoyed even though they lost it but in that innocence they had an untainted relationship with god they had unfettered access to god god walked with them in the cool of the day and every attempt at human progress that we have seen throughout human history can go back to the fall which severely affected it so we live our lives in this sin corrupted world um, and there are devastating results of their rebellion and our rebellion as well we long for paradise we long for the world to be what it was supposed to be without corruption Um, and because we're human beings we desire something that is tangible something that is physical just as we're made from the earth, so too are we are made for the earth. And this is what this is, uh, we're going to look at tonight. Um, some might say, well, hold on a second. You say we're made for the earth. Didn't Jesus tell us disciples in, Matthew, in John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms or many dwelling places. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And so sometimes we hear that promise from Jesus in John 14. He's going to prepare a place for us that this place is somehow far away from what we experience or what we know or what we can understand here. But Revelation 21 and several other passages we'll look at tonight demonstrate that our final home, when we are finally home, is the new earth, the new heavens, And the new earth that come together. Only then will we be finally home. That's the ultimate reach of redemption. Well, there's four things about this concept I want us to consider tonight. The first one is this. I want us to think about a little further heaven's earthly reality. A lot of times when we think of heaven, we think of it as being completely bifurcated from earth. But that's not the heaven that the Bible presents. The Bible presents that there will be an eternal new earth. And that suggests that the current earth 
is bursting with clues about what the final earth is going to be like, what the new earth is going to be like. And so as we go through the scriptures, we can look at these clues that are in existence in the Bible, and there's something like jigsaw puzzle pieces that we can put together and start to get some type of understanding of what our future home is going to be like. For example, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, the author of Hebrews commends um, Abraham's faith. And I want you to notice what Abraham was looking forward to. He, Abraham, was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. So, Abraham was longing for a city, not just an ethereal existence out in the netherworld, a city which has foundations. Look at uh, a few chapters later, Hebrews 13, 14, says this, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. So here's a clue. Our final destination, our final heaven, is something like a city. So here's a question, class. What are some things that we know are in cities? Buildings? Houses? Streets? Trees, yeah. Rivers? Is there culture? Is there art? Is there music? Is there industry? Yeah, all those things are in cities. There's people, there's goods and services, there's entertainment. Um, cities have activities, gatherings, commerce, conversations, hustle and bustle. And the Bible says we are longing for a city. But in Hebrews, heaven is also described this way, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. So here's another clue. Not only is our final destination like a city, it's also like a country. Well, what is a country? Well, a country has territories, has rulers, has ordered of authority, it has borders, it has national interests. There ought to be a common identity. There ought to be a common unity. Even, dare I say the word, patriotism. That ought to be experienced in a common country. And so this is uh, what we're looking forward to. And again, some of the natural elements that you talked about, the, the New Testament talks about them as well. Trees, rivers, flowers, streams. Um, these are all elements of the better country. So we wouldn't expect a non-earth, some type of ethereal spiritual existence to have these things. But that is not our final destination. That is not our final home. The new earth is our final home. And it's these features particularly that are mentioned in um, Revelation 21, which we'll look at multiple times throughout uh, this series over the next eight weeks or so. Um, the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 15 and other places that we'll receive new bodies. So could we look at our current bodies and take some clues about what maybe our new body will be like? Could we? Yeah, it's not going to be identical, but we'll be known as we are known. Um, we can imagine what it's like to have a body in the final home because we have a body now. So we can sense what the physical reality of that is. We, we've had a body all of our lives. So just as we can imagine an eternal physical existence in a body, we can also imagine an eternal existence on a new earth because we, well, we live on the earth. So that means the, the present earth is really a valid reference point for what the new earth is going to be like. Again, this new earth is nothing as far as beauty and, and experience that the new earth is going to have, but it is uh, something of a reference point the same way our bodies are. Our bodies, as we just rehearsed in our prayer time, are racked with disease and death. They will not in the new earth. The new bodies will not, right? Our bodies are getting weaker by the day, aren't they? The new bodies will not. Um, so the idea of this new earth as a physical place 
It, it's not this just invention of short-sighted imagination. It's the reality of what we're going to do and what we're going to experience. The transcendent God created physical human beings and placed them in the Garden of Eden, a place of perfection and innocence. That was his design from the beginning. And so the redemption is going to return to something like that of beauty and experience and fulfillment and and jobs things to do so this is heaven's earthly reality there is a connection to earth here's the next point god's earthly renewal god's earthly renewal the entire physical universe was created for god's glory Humanity was created for God's glory. But Adam and Eve sinned. The serpent's seduction worked on the first humans. But even at that, before Adam and Eve sinned, did that take God by surprise? No, it did not. You see, because Christ was crucified from before the foundation of the world. Before there ever was a physical earth, the plan of redemption, the plan of renewal was already in place. So Adam and Eve sinned, and God already had a plan for renewing the earth and redeeming his people. And just as he promises to make people new again, to renew us, he also promises to renew the earth. I want to show you a couple of examples. He made this promise in Isaiah 65, 17. He says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. In the very next chapter, he says this, For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. The Apostle Peter in the New Testament, who got all of his eschatological information, that's information about the end, that's information about the future, he got all of that directly from Jesus. He had direct revelation from Jesus, both in person and as an apostle who was writing Holy Scripture Notice what Peter said in 2 Peter 3. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This is the hope. This is the confidence. This is the future that we're waiting on. Again, not just a spiritual heaven where we're floating around in bodiless souls. We're waiting for a physical existence in this new earth. And then, of course, Revelation 21 says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There's many other passages that we could look at to see which allude to this reality of a new heaven and a new earth. God's redemptive plan climaxes when all of his creation, not just human beings, when all of his creation experiences the renewal that he has intended. In fact, think about it. If God's plan was only to bring redeemed believers, Christians, children to this intermediate heaven, to a heaven where we were just dwelling as spirit beings, there would be no need for a new earth, would there? If we're just to be in the spiritual heaven and in spiritual existence, why even create a new earth? Well, upon creating the new heavens and the new earth, he called the original heavens and earth good he created humankind very good never once has he renounced his claim on the goodness of his creation he's going to restore it god will bring heaven and earth together notice what paul said in in ephesians 1 here's the plan there's a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him that's jesus things in heaven and things on the earth. Jesus rules. Jesus reigns. Hebrews chapter 10, among others, that he says that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting until that day when his enemies will be made a footstool at his feet. Jesus reigns. But he reigns not just over people, but he reigns over all of creation. All things will be united under Jesus. But somehow in our longing for eternity we've managed to overlook some biblical vocabulary some words that are used to describe jesus's work the work of uh, this future that we're anticipating 
Let me show you a few biblical words. Reconcile, redeem, restore, recover, return, renew, regenerate. What do all these words have in common? Re. They all begin with the prefix re. And most of these actually begin with a, a Greek prefix, ana, which means the same thing. Re. It means to return or renew. It's the same idea. So what, is, what, is, what do these words mean? Think about redeem. What does redemption mean? It means to buy back, to purchase back something that's been uh, formerly owned. Reconciliation. What does that mean? To restore a, a relationship, to reestablish a friendship or a unity. What does renewal mean? It's to make it new again, right? To renew it. Uh, resurrection. What does that mean? I don't even have resurrection on there, do I? <laughs> That's a big one. Resurrection means to bring brought from death to life. These are some of the words that God emphasizes that this is what heaven will involve. And this is not just a human salvation, though it certainly is. It is all of creation. He will restore everything. Do you know what a salvage artist is? Somebody that takes junk and turns it into art. <laughs> it's a nice way of saying a salvage artist. My daughter, Ashley, she's not a salvage artist, but she loves taking junk and turning it into something useful. I'll go to her house, and I said, what is that? Oh, Dad, I found it on the side of the road. Wait till you see what I'm going to do with it. I mean, she had this one huge chest that was just, it was junk. But she worked on it and worked on it and worked on it and painted it and reworked it until it was a central piece in her home for several years. Um, so that's what salvage artists do they find things that people throw away that are of no worth at least we don't think they're of any worth and then they reuse them yesterday we had a recycling company come by and and gather up a lot of our old electronic gear that's been gathering in closets and corners and so it was about a van load of stuff bunch of junk and so in speaking with the uh, owner of the recycling company he said uh you know a lot of these electronics actually have a, a little bit of gold in them. He said, last year we recycled over a million dollars worth of gold. <laughs> he said, now we didn't see all that, but that's how much we were able to, to get out of these components and these units and all that. So in, in addition to copper and silver and other uh, metals that they can use and, and find some value in. This is all junk to us, just taking up room and collecting dust, right? This is what God is the ultimate salvage artist. He takes what is completely junk. Anybody hear junk before you met Christ? I was. And he is the ultimate salvage artist to take that junk and to turn it into something of incredible value and worth. In fact, look at this great hymn. Jesus, what a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. This is who our God is, and this is what Jesus has done. That's another reword, reclaim, right? To restore that which has been lost. In fact, notice how Psalm 24 puts it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell within it. You need to know something. God has not relinquished his ownership of the world. It may have a tenant right now, the ruler of this world, the ruler of this present age, the evil one, but God has not relinquished title. He owns the earth and everything that is in it. It's impossible to understand the full ministry of Jesus, and even the ministry that he accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection without taking into mind the full renewal of all of creation that Christ has done. In fact, if you think about it, consider 
the miracles that Jesus performed when he was on the earth. Except for one miracle, and that one being the cursing of the fig tree, every other miracle that Jesus performed was a miracle of restoration, a miracle of renewal. Either that was renewal of health, it was a renewal of liberation from demonic oppression, it was a renewal or rescue from the shackles of sin, and reinstating somebody to live as God had intended them. That was just a preview, a thumbnail preview of this sweeping renewal that Christ will accomplish when he returns. So that's the second thing. Number three, Jesus' earthly redemption. Redemption, as I mentioned earlier, means to buy back, to redeem. In this context, it means that God's going to buy back and return things to his original design. Again, Adam and Eve were in the garden. They experienced the blessings of paradise. And paradise extended, I believe, through the entire world. And then through their sin, through their um, lostness, paradise was lost. But this re earthly redemption means that he's going to restore and redeem the original mandate and the original dominion that God had given them to exercise. Remember, that was one of the th responsibilities. They were to exercise dominion over the earth. So when the earth is redeemed and restored and the new earth is, comes down, who's going to have dominion over the new earth? People, humans. That's what we were created for. We were created to have dominion. Why did God give Adam and Eve dominion? Why would God give us dominion in the new earth when everything is redeemed? God is all about his glory, because God gets great glory in that. Um, most of you all know I uh, raised my children on, the, uh, on Charles Spurgeon Catechism, which is basically a baptized Westminster Catechism. So the uh, questions about baptism are not Presbyterian, they're Baptist. <laughs> so, but that's what uh, this question and answer, and so we memorized those questions through their childhood. Um, the very first question, here we go, is this. What is man's chief end? Does anybody know the answer? Yes, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Look at that last part. How long are we in to enjoy God? Forever. That is our chief end. That's why we've been created, to bring glory to God and to enjoy him forever. And so by him giving us dominion over the earth, that is a means that God has designed for us to, one, give him glory, and two, enjoy him. Adam and Eve got to enjoy him, but then they believed the lie. We will worship him as resurrected beings, carrying out his design for developing a Christ-centered culture, cities, country, earth. In fact, notice how 1 Corinthians 15 describes this aspect of our redemption. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, so the return of Christ, our resurrection, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of, to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So Christ's mission is to both redeem and to restore what was lost and to destroy all the competitors of God's dominion. Everything that raises its head against the rule of God. And then mankind will rule as his co-regents under his authority. Again, God's all about his, his glory. Um, this is the goal for which we were created. This is the goal for which the earth was created. Psalm, one, psalm 19, I wrote a song about this psalm maybe 35 years ago. Well, it was before I even met Amy, a little longer than that. And it's just a glorious picture of the purpose of the earth. And it says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. 
This is the purpose of the earth. This is the purpose of creation. This is the purpose of the universe. God's glory being revealed on earth. And this is really central to a lot of passages in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. Let me show you a couple of examples. Psalm 50, 85, 9, another one of my favorites, which describes the restoration of God uh, in the earth, says this, Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell where? In our land. And then, and then Ezekiel 43 says this, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone his glory. Interestingly, the word there, earth and land, in the other verse I showed you from Psalm 85, it's the same Hebrew word. Land, earth, this terra firma, God promised through the prophets that he would restore everything. And the point of God's kingdom, the point of God's dominion, is that he would receive great glory. And so God has tied his glory to the earth, to the land, and everything connected to it. Mankind, plants, animals, atmosphere, trees, rivers, everything is part of his vision of the new earth. And so again, I mentioned earlier, we have a vantage point where we can at least imagine what the new earth is going to be like because we're living on a present earth. It is sin sick. It is corrupt. The Bible says in Romans 8 that all of creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth waiting for this redemption because it's going to be so much greater. Here's something else to think about when we think about earth's redemption, God will also redeem humanity's ingenuity for his own purposes and glory. I want you to think about, I saw a graph one time that showed the inventions throughout human history. And it showed from the beginning of human history, as we can record back, up to the year 1900, the total number number of technological inventions and advances and from 19 from the beginning of time to 1900 on the graph it took about this much space and it said in the inventions and the technological advancements from 1900 to the year 2000 and the graph was like this big the technological advances from the year 2000 to today so we have had more technological advances in the last 24 years than all of human history combined is this bizarre it is incredible the advances of technology that are happening at lightning speed. God's going to redeem those things. In fact, notice a couple of passages from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. And here's an example of things that br bring mankind pride in 600 BC against all the ships of Tarshish and against all the beautiful craft. So these apparently ships of Tarshish were the height of technological achievement as far as seafaring vessels. And he says these are vessels that are used for the pride and the arrogance of humanity. Do you think Modern inventions bring humanity pride, arrogance, thinking we can, we, who, why do we need God? We have all these technological achievements and advances. What do we need God for? But notice what Isaiah, what God says through Isaiah towards the end of the book in chapter 60. He says, for the coastlands shall hope for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from afar, their silver and gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. So God says these ships of Tarshish that were used and were emblems of humankind's pride and arrogance and lofty thinking, God is going to take those things and use them for himself, for his own glory. I, I can't even begin to imagine what God's going to do with all the technology that exists in the world today. Can't imagine. But all the things, you think about the technology of the internet and how the number one business on the internet is what? Pornography. Pornography. 
It's used for evil. Now, we use it every day, but it's used for evil. There's so much industry and invention and ingenuity because God's placed it in our hearts. We are people of the earth designed to create, right? And God's going to take that and he's going to use it for his own glory. How will this happen? How will God do this? Well, you go to the very next chapter of Isaiah and we learn how this things that are used for human pride begin to bring God glory. Look at this, Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This Isaiah prediction is quoted in the New Testament. Does anybody remember where? It's quoted by Jesus. It's actually read by Jesus. He's in his hometown of Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. He goes into his hometown synagogue. Here he is, this rabbi, this hometown boy who's done good. Hey, Jesus, why don't you read from the scroll of Isaiah? He turns to this passage. He reads this exact section from Isaiah 61. He folds up the scroll, hands it to the attendant, sits down, and the text says all of the eyes were upon him. What did Jesus say? Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow! Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Remember what they did with their hometown boy? They took him out of the synagogue, went over to a cliff, and they were ready to throw him over the cliff and kill him because he claimed he's the Messiah. He claimed he's going to be the one to restore all of the glory that God is pronouncing. And the text says he slipped out from them. Whoop. I don't know how he did it. I don't know if he disappeared or if he just was like slippery. I don't know. You know, did a little kung fu move. I don't know how he did it, but the text doesn't say. But he got away from their grasp. But Jesus, listen, Jesus is the one who does this. Jesus is the one who restores the earth. Jesus is the one who takes all of our technological inventions and all of our advancements that we can become so prideful about and he turns them and redeems them for the glory of God. This is all included in Jesus' earthly redemption. But that leads to the fourth and final thing I want us to consider. Number four, the curse is reversed. When Adam and Eve sinned and fell into sin, Satan appeared to have ruined God's plan. Of course, we know he didn't. But it seemed that God's plan for a righteous humanity that lived for his glory to rule over the earth, to be his regents, that that plan was ruined. And a curse was pronounced. That curse that he pronounced, that God pronounced, had far-reaching effects. The curse affected man, his toil and his work. Again, we were created to work. Genesis 2.15 God put man in the garden to work it and keep it. Well, that work all of, a, all of a sudden became very laborious and difficult and hard. The earth was cursed. It would bring forth thorns and thistles, difficult to toil the ground. The woman was cursed, cursed in her childbearing and cursed in her um, difficulty of submitting to the order that God had designed in the home. But who else was cursed? The serpent was cursed. The serpent was cursed. And the curse that was pronounced on the serpent is Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you, serpent, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. While the wound of sin was still fresh in the garden, the scar had not even begun to form, God pronounced a restorer god pronounced a redeemer god pronounced one who would come and would intervene into this issue by providing a mortal wound excuse me providing a mortal wound to the devil in the process he would himself be wounded his heel would be bruised but the serpent's head would be crushed Think about it. Part of the curse 
and the consequence of the curse was sin and death. So the removal of the curse would mean no more sin and no more death, no more dying. But another part of the result of the curse for Adam and Eve was banishment from the garden, banishment from the tree of life. And the assumption is, doesn't specifically say, but the assumption is by theologians is they were banished from the garden and no longer eat the tree of life because if they ate of the tree of life, they would eternally be in that state of death and no hope of redemption. Therefore, there is an expectation in the new earth that there will be a tree of life. In fact, the Bible says there will be a tree of life in the new earth. But this is going to be brought about through the redemption of this promised seed or descendant of the woman. As you move forward through the Old Testament, more clues are given about this person. You move forward to Genesis chapter 22, you discover that this individual would be a descendant of Abraham, the patriarch. You move forward to Genesis chapter 49, you discover he's going to come out of the tribe of Judah. Twelve tribes, only one tribe will be the source of this descendant. You move to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and God promises not only is he coming from the house of Judah, but he's coming from the house of David, going to be one of David's descendants. So throughout the Old Testament, there are promises about the identity of this deliverer. Of course, we know the reality is that Christ, Jesus, fulfilled all those requirements in all those places. Christ has already defeated Satan. He hung him out to dry, if you will. He displayed him as a defeated foe when he died on the cross. And Ephesians 1 says this is the reality after Christ's ascension, that he worked, God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he, God the Father, put all things under his, God the Son's, feet and gave him as head over all things those are in the past tense he gave him past tense head over all things so this is the already not yet dynamic that we receive see often in the bible god's already won (laughs) the battle is over jesus has already defeated the evil one But the not yet is, it's not yet come to pass in the chronology of our existence. There is going to be a great final war, but the outcome of that great final war is not in question. Christ will reign victoriously forever and ever. In fact, notice how Revelation 22 puts it, no longer will there be anything accursed. So we've been talking about the curse that was pronounced in the garden. Here's the promise at the end of the book. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. The Bible said, this is eternal life. This is heaven. This is the new earth. If the Bible hadn't given these kind of clues, we would be kind of in no man's land of understanding, but there are clues Adam sinned, God cursed the ground because of his sin, but there's coming a day when the curse will be reversed. No longer will the earth yield thorns and thistles. No longer will we have the difficult, laborious, uh, unsatisfying work. As a result of the garden as well, I mentioned a moment ago, Adam and Eve were banished from the garden so they couldn't eat of the tree of life. But notice what Revelation 22 also says. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to eat, the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. So there's a connection in the new earth and Eden. What do we see? The tree of life. The tree of life is in both places. And so there's coming a day when God redeems it all and the curse is completely reversed that we who know Christ will gather around the tree of life and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Isaac Watts, great hymn writer, wrote probably one of the best Christmas hymns, Joy to the World. But the third verse is my favorite. 
It says this, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found. And if you didn't hear it, far as, far as the curse is found. There will be a complete and total reversal of the curse. How far does Christ's redemptive work extend? How far is redemption's reach? As far as the curse is found. Every grain of sand that's been cursed. So if redemption failed to reach the furthest boundaries of the curse, then the redemption would be incomplete and insufficient. But it is not incomplete. It is not insufficient. Jesus came to rescue people from this ultimate destru destruction and to rescue this planet. It's, it whets our appetites a little bit to think about it, doesn't it? To think about a uncursed planet, an uncursed existence. Right now, we kind of get a little halftone image. It's faded, it's blurry, it's somewhat out of focus, but there will be a time when we will see clearly and we'll see Christ face to face. And that leads to my last thought. Without Christ, not only mankind, but the whole earth would be doomed. But Christ came to bring ultimate, complete, total, final deliverance. Let's praise him through prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you, according to Philippians chapter 2, did not regard equality as something to be grasped, but you humbled himself, yourself, taking upon the form of a servant and being found in human form, you became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted you and bestowed upon you the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Lord, you also said, have this mind among yourselves that is yours in Christ Jesus, that we would humble ourselves that we would not look at our saved position that are seated in heavenly places, our names written in the Lamb's book of life, that we would not be prideful, and arrogant, lofty in our thinking, but we would have the same mind as Christ who didn't regard this as something to be clung to, but that we would humble ourselves and become servants, servants to one another, servants to the least of these in our spheres of relationships, and ultimately servants of you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.